Thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's lovely to have you all here and, and lovely to have you here for this particular event. So this is a part of the FIMS hashtag public, public interest series, but it's also a Canada 150 lecture that we're, that's why we're holding it on campus here. And it's a lecture that's um, given by Ed Comer, who's our faculty scholar right now. Edward Comer. Oh boy. Edward Comer. So, Edward has been teaching at FIMS for the past 14 years. His research has always focused on the political economy of communication and culture, and the work of Harold Innes has been a central source and inspiration. In fact, in the spring or early summer of 2018, what most viewed to be Innes's lost book, Political Economy in the Modern State, is being republished by the University of Toronto Press for the first time and Edward and Robert Babe are its editors. So Edward is here tonight to talk to us on Harold Innes in Canada. Uh, not only is it an honor to have been asked to do this, also it's, it's, it's quite remarkable because <clears throat> uh, 36 years ago, when I was admitted to the University of Toronto, the college I was assigned to was Innes College. At the time, I didn't know who Innes was. And in fact, I wasn't alone. Uh, the, the school song begins, who the hell was Harold Innes? <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> and it wasn't really until my fourth year that um, I, 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 clued, I clued into, oh, this is an important person, I should, I should read his work. Because not only was communications and political economy uh, my main interest, but of course he was Canadian. And his work reflects some very unique uh, Canadian and nationalistic themes, which I'm going to touch upon this evening. <clears throat> but in preparing this talk, um, I realized that the nature of Innes' nationalism is rather complex and I think provocative. So my focus tonight is going to be on, on that. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that someone who uh, was seen as you know, the ultimate Canadian scholar was by the end of his life very pessimistic about Canada and the role Canada could play. But we'll get to that. Innes didn't have, long, have, have a long life. He died just after his 58th birthday in November 1952. In that year, he wrote that, oh, let me use this. Can I do it? Yes. The effects of developments involving commercialism, communications technologies and U.S. power and Canadian culture have been disastrous. The dangers to national existence warrant an energetic program to offset them. We are indeed fighting for our lives. This and other references to what many now call cultural imperialism, alongside Innes's work promoting Canadian academics, have made Innes's nationalist credentials something of an unquestionable fact. In the United States, for example, he was simply known as Innes of Canada. Innes was born in 1894. This is a blow-up picture of him when he was 10. And the one on the right is a blow-up picture of him when he visited Russia in 1946, and he was 50. He was born in, on a farm near Otterville, which is about a 35-minute drive east of here. His books, of course, include The Fur Trade in Canada, published in 1930, a work that constituted the beginning of a new approach to economic history. In the years that followed, among other things, he served on federal and provincial royal commissions. He was the primary force behind the establishment of the Canadian Social Science Research Council. He was the president of the Royal Society of Canada. He became the first non-American to be elected president of the American Economics Association. He became the first Canadian to be appointed dean of graduate studies at the University of Toronto. And shortly before his death, the governor general came to his home and at his bedside, uh, he was dying of cancer, thanked him for his service to Canada. Innes also was in charge of the Canadian contributions to an unprecedented book series sponsored by the Carnegie Endowment in New York called Relations of Canada and the United States. In this project, he defied his American partners by commissioning studies that undercut the endowment's goal of promoting US-Canadian commonalities commonalities that could support arguments for what was then termed continentalism. Innes, by the way, also threatened to resign 
from the University of Toronto on several occasions, all over decisions concerning the development of the Canadian Academy. During the Second World War, to mention just one instance, he made this threat to stop the university's plans to cut funding to its arts and humanities programs, something that we here at Western are familiar with. In a country with far fewer universities than it has today, and in a culture in which the status of the academic was, again, relative to today, high, as the country's best known social scientist, Innes had a certain amount of clout, which he used to champion Canadian culture and academic developments, sometimes in a manipulative way. With all this in mind, most would regard even the notion that Innes was, wasn't first and foremost a Canadian nationalist to be worse, worse than nonsensical. For some, it certainly would be sacrilegious. But this evening, 150 years after Confederation and 65 years after his death, I want to somewhat challenge our assumptions regarding what Innes understood Canadian nationalism and Canada as a nation state to be, <clears throat> its qualities, its role, and its purpose. Innes's views are, I think, fairly unique, and some of them certainly today challenge our thinking about nationalism as well as Canada. To begin to understand Innes on the subject of Canada, we need to cover some biographical points. This is the photograph that I took the 10-year-old picture from, blew it up. His school was a one-room classroom in Otterville. That's his school. Uh, this is taken in 1904. Um, first, about his background and upbringing. He always occupied what one might call the margins of his community. For one thing, the relative poverty of the Innes family in the Otterville community and his obvious intellectual abilities made him stand out as someone who was clearly different. More than this, Innes was raised as a Baptist. In that tradition, at least in his community, it was important to enable the individual to make an informed decision as to whether or not to accept the salvation of Christ. Innes, during his youth, thus was exposed to some great questions of life and some of the big issues facing the world. We know, for example, that Innes' family had very few books, but through his Baptist education, he read a range of things. And through people he knew, for one, his uncle, he read, for example, a socialist regional newspaper called Cotton's Weekly. After attending a Baptist secondary school in Woodstock in 1913, Innes went to the Baptist-founded McMaster University, then in Toronto. So McMaster moved from Toronto to Hamilton, I think in 1920, 1925, somewhere around then. Um, well, and this picture here, you, you'll, you'll probably know that um, this is the same building as the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto. So on the left is the, is the ROM, so it's the same building. In Toronto, um, away from his family and exposed to the dynamism of the city, Innes was pushed to ask still further questions concerning just about everything, including whether or not a university education was even worth pursuing. His mother wanted, to, wanted him to be a minister. In fact, on his birth certificate, his name is written Harold, H-E-R-A-L-D. We know that Innes' self-reflective character and spiritual interests blossomed at this time particularly as a result of his exposure to philosophy at McMaster. In fact, the only undergraduate notes that he kept from those years were from a philosophy course. The central question posed in that course was one that Innes addressed directly in his later communication studies. In fact, this could be the defining question of his, def of his communication studies. Why do we attend to the things to which we attend? Now, you can imagine as an undergraduate, that's your question in your final exam. <laughs> Thanks. It's arguably a question that could be seen as a basis for a critique of nationalism. Why do we attend to the things to which we attend? Why would we die and kill for something which is so abstract? After his BA at McMaster, Innes enlisted to fight in the Great War. It was his experience in that war that dramatically changed his views especially in light of the critical questions he'd been asking for years. Most significantly, he completely rejected his belief in God and religion. 
Before the war, many at McMaster, like many at McMaster, Innes was not interested in appeals to defend the British Empire, as the slide on the left um, appeals to. Beyond the Baptist belief in a clear separation between church and state, we might also postulate that Innes was not exposed to the kinds of king and country rhetoric that he might have been had he been raised in a city. Radio, of course, didn't come into the fore until Innes was in his 20s. Also due to the tenuousness of the Innes family farm and its ability to keep up or inability to keep up with the shifting demands of cities in Canada and overseas, it's arguable that Innes felt little sympathy for the needs of the metropole. And we know this because we have records of the Innes farm constantly changing what it was growing, trying to at least break even and being into more and more debt to banks. But as recruitment efforts heated up and the war was reframed as the defense of not just the empire, but of Christianity and democracy, as in the other extreme poster on your right, Innes signed up, enlisting in 1916 as a private, even though, and I don't know why, he could have signed up as an officer. Signed up as a private and he was sent to France in the fall of that year. To get a sense of his thinking at the time, let me quote from a letter he sent home just before his deployment. He wrote, if I shouldn't go and I should content myself with the fact that I had not lived up to my duty, that Christ had asked me once to take up his cross and follow him and I hadn't been able to do it. Germany started this war by breaking a treaty, by breaking her sealed word. If any nation and if any person can break their word with no notice whatever, then what is the world coming to? There's a degree of naivete, obviously, in the young Innes. In July of 1917, Innes was seriously wounded. That's him on the right in the hospital in England. He spent eight months in various military hospitals before he was sent back to Canada. From this wartime experience, he learned to distrust and even hate the British officers who mistreated colonial soldiers and more generally, he developed an antipathy to all the authorities behind the mismanagement and manipulation that led to millions of deaths. He was especially disgusted by the use of jingoistic propaganda to whip up public opinion. But more than this, Innes recognized a certain insanity, insanity to have emerged when technologies of killing were wedded to techniques of manipulation. Poison gas, for example, he's wearing his standard issue gas mask around his neck. On the flip side of this, he was struck by the failure of democracy, the press, and public education to question these from the very start. For the rest of his life, he rarely talked about the war. He refused to attend remembrance services. Not only was it emotionally impossible for him, it, was, it also enraged him, in part because of their use of patriotism. In his refer to war, as the ultimate obscenity. From the First World War, a central dynamic in his thinking became explicit. His disdain for most forms of authority and more abstractly, a growing awareness of the classic dialectic between power and knowledge, otherwise called power and intelligence. Now I'm gonna get a little, little bit professor, professorial with you. Uh, in this dialectic, one that can be traced back to at least ancient Greece, power, and with it the use of force, involves the coercive capabilities of many large organizations. And in this time, obviously the nation state, but also empires and even more broadly civilizations. While knowledge involves the intelligence and creativity that any such organization needs to survive over time. Knowledge in turn needs power to safeguard it. This, as Innes understood, is rarely a relationship that's in balance. It's rarely in balance because those in power generally seek administrative and force-enabling forms of knowledge, more than critical and creative forms of knowledge. So, especially in assessing the 20th century, Innes came to see the machinery of the state to have been mobilized to exploit rather than facilitate knowledge. His opposition to U of T's plans to cut arts and humanities programs during the Second World War, for example, stemmed in part, I think, from his concern for this neglect. It was this kind of knowledge, the philosophical and self-reflective in particular, 
that he thought was essential for survival, or at least essential if democracies were to be able to question the nonsense that led to the atrocities you saw all around him, including, of course, the Great War. As Innes saw it, this neglect of what he called living knowledge in relation to the ascent of what he termed dead knowledge was tantamount to a neglect of civilization itself. When Innes returned to Canada in 1918, he was already wary of nationalism's dark side. And later, as he began his career as a faculty member at the U of T, he was also hostile to the academy's status quo that deemed British and other foreign academics to be superior. This was a bone of contention for Innes in particular, as his research, the only research of its kind, I should add, raised foundational questions as to the usefulness and accuracy of the then dominant metropolitan paradigms in economics, primarily neoclassical theory, but also Keynesianism and, among radicals, the Marxist approach. These three approaches were largely taken as is in Canada, with few modifications, for several reasons. One was their institutional status among scholars trained in metropolitan centers, such as England or the United States. Uh, Innes went to the University of Chicago for his PhD in economics, for example. And as such, they tended to see the margins of the world, not just Canada, but Australia, New Zealand, parts of Africa, etc., as if they were mostly just extensions of these intellectual or political economic centers. There wasn't a interaction, a dynamic or a dialectic between core and margin or center and periphery. As scholars in Canada mostly trained outside of the country, uh, they tended to see Canadian conditions also as extensions of these theories and structures. And as almost no one had done detailed empirical work on the development of places like Canada, there was little recognition of the insights that Innes' research from the margins approach might produce. In his field, uh, Innes called this neglected research dirt economics. In the 1920s, each year he spent several months traveling from mining town to pulp and paper mill to fishing village to old fur trading station, taking copious notes on their histories and the experience of local workers, immigrants, First Nations peoples, and many others. The, the stack of notes you'll find in the, in the archives are enormous on these travels. The picture you see here is a trip out west he took in 1924. On the left, He's going up the Peace River in the Yukon in a canoe, of course, the only way to get anywhere at the time in that part of the world. On the right, he's on a river steamer going up the Mackenzie River. While in Toronto, Innes also taught a summer school, summer school courses for an organization I used to be involved with called the Workers Educational Association. And in fact, he was so dedicated to the Workers Educational Association that he, in fact, risked his job by informing uh, the WEA, which it was called, um, that the University of Toronto wanted to introduce uh, adult education courses to essentially take the market away from the nonprofit Workers Educational Association, risking his job to, in doing that. And it's perhaps more than any academic in the country, in fact, as a result of these experiences, new Canadians. And this gave him some amount of credibility among his colleagues and others when talking about domestic affairs. Through his dirt economics, Innes came to appreciate the complexity and importance of cultural factors in development. Anyone reading his work today, I promise you, would see the nativist forms of nationalism that we see expressed, for example, in Trumpism as absolutely idiotic. Because in Innes' work, there's an incredible complex of interactions between cultures especially in the fur trade, but in other examples as well. And Canada wouldn't be what it is without that interaction of cultures. In his research on Canada, he also identified dynamics and contradictions that were not addressed by the dominant approaches. Versus the Keynesians, for example, he identified the Canadian state to be as much an institutional problem for Canadians as it was a necessary means of alleviating problems. Innes found that the Canadian state was established primarily as a means of securing and extending finance for the extraction of staples products. You know, fish, fur, wheat, timber, minerals, gold, hydroelectric power, etc. By institutionalizing this mode of development, it forged an ongoing history of dependency and vulnerability to, state, to, to, to metropolitan centers, not to mention the vested interests or class interests that they represent. This is, of course, 
shortened to be called the Staples Approach to Canadian Economic History. Hmm. Okay, well. During the Depression years in the 1930s, Innes became profoundly disturbed by the Canadian response to the crisis. In fact, for a brief period in 1937, he suffered a severe mental breakdown. Some sought solutions to the Depression by grafting the paradigms of others onto Canada, as with Keynesianism and Marxism. And more broadly, others turned to the development of more direct economic ties to the United States, as in continentalism, as the logical way forward. Yet again, despite now being Canada's preeminent economist, Innes found himself to be on the intellectual margins, or to be more precise, to be in the position of an insider-outsider. By the mid-1930s, he, he was well known for questioning the proposals put forward by others. So in royal commissions he participated in, he almost never was part of the majority opinion or the consensus. He would write something separate, or he would threaten to resign if a different perspective wasn't presented, because he saw his job there uh, as being not giving answers, but of asking questions and compelling people to think critically about the institutionalized direction that they were going. In fact, at this time, no one quite knew what he really thought. The RCMP employed students to file reports on his classroom activities, among other things. In this period, Innes developed the position that it was not the scholar's job to come up with answers for policymakers and publics. For one thing, the situation was too complex to pretend that path solutions were possible. For another, he believed that the more involved academics became in doing the job of policymakers and publics, the more applied, specialized, and biased their work would become. Under these circumstances, he wrote, we can, this is an example of his humor, which I'll give a few more of momentarily, we can begin to appreciate the remarks of an Oxford Don who said after solving a very difficult problem in mathematics, thank God no one can use that. In other words, thank God that the work I'm doing is so abstract and reflective, it can't be readily simplified, consumed, and exploited by those in power. Power ultimately, oh, I should mention this. This, of course, draws from the Greeks. It's the scholar's job, in accordance with Plato and others, to find truth. Not to, not to find the truth, but to search for truth. Plato's philosopher king was a bad idea. Ultimately, power destroys knowledge, and academics who work directly for power, whether mainstream or progressive, economic or political, will find themselves to be ever more specialized and mechanized in what they do and indeed how they think. These are all, of course, generalizations. This, in his thought, is reflected in what he called the incipient fascism of the Canadian Academy. In Canada, certainly during the Depression, the prospective truth of institutionalized approaches to solving the crisis involved even larger, more worrisome truths. Truths, for example, about our unquestionable duty to do research and teach courses that can be applied to solving national problems. Such developments in this would categorize as parts of a broader historical crisis that he would call the mechanization of knowledge. During the Second World War, Innes retreated from most of his colleagues and spent much of his time alone in the library. He was working on what would become his never completed 1400 page manuscript on the history of communications. This work was, of course, something entirely new. It was an effort and an approach that arguably was only conceivable in a marginal country like Canada by an academic who, while he rejected institutionalized paradigms, also had a deep interest in learning from the past. Innes, as McLuhan said, was an intellectual freak. In fact, McLuhan once asked, quote, how did that hick Baptist ever come up with this amazing method of studying the effects of technology? Part of the answer is that Innes was, in fact, a hick Baptist. Or at least this was his upbringing. And as we'll see, it's this marginal position as both an insider and outsider that is of great importance if we are to understand Innes' views on Canada's potentials as an insider-outsider culture in relation to the dying British Empire and the ascended American. By the way, he got this insider-outsider perspective not just from his research, and also his understanding of, of history, um, 
but his intellectual hero, uh, Thorsten Veblen, had a well-known article, 1899. I think it was called, and this will offend people today, the title, but this was really what it was about, on the intellectual preeminence of the Jews. And it was asked the question, why is it that the great works of genius in the 19th century, Marx, Freud, later Einstein, were by European Jews? Well, these were the consummate insiders, outsiders. They had access to the resources of the core, of the inside, of the great institutions. Yet, culturally, they had a different perspective of things, which allowed them to think in ways and perceive in th the ways that, in ways that the people in the core itself were blind to, biased to. Innes's communication studies are difficult to read in part because what he is doing in them is difficult, especially as he's developing an approach that doesn't fit into the paradigms we're used to. And I don't think he ever wanted to present something that laid out some kind of easy to institutionalize approach. As he once put it, to the founders of schools, all can be forgiven except for their schools. And this reminds me, by the way, of Marx, who shortly before his death said, reportedly, if there's one thing I know, I'm not a Marxist. He said that in French, but. <laughs> so once your work is institutionalized, it becomes concretized in ways which undercut its vibrancy. Also, it's clear that as Innes became more critical of both the Canadian status quo and his colleagues, he recognized that whatever influence he had had would quickly diminish as he became more explicit about his views and opposition. As he said in 1946, he felt compelled to, quote, write in such a guarded fashion that no one can understand what I'm saying, unquote. Innes also profound, probably wanted his readers to be intellectually engaged in what he was saying. And he did this by compelling them to, in fact, think. You cannot read the later Innes without working very, very hard. So for example, in his very well-known essay, Minerva's Owl, when I was studying it as a PhD student, I took a month or two to go to then the museum library in Toronto, which had all the holdings of all the sources that Innes used for that particular article. And I read all the sources for his article on that because I couldn't understand the article without reading his sources. That's the kind of engagement that he demands of you if you're to understand what he's trying to do. Innes had disdain for Canadians parroting the reactionary forms of anti-communism he saw in the States as with McCarthyism. Canadians, in his mind, had even taken up the imperialist thinking of Americans, at least in Ottawa's management of the provinces. He wrote, in resisting American imperialism, we developed our own type of imperialism. Its character became evident in the growing insistence on nationalism. That is, nationalist reasons were given to dismiss, dismiss or marginalize the interests of people in regions, other regions of Canada. But also, Innes's writings about Canada and other concerns involve, particularly in his later years, the use of out from the blue quotations, which the readers left to figure out on his or her own. And his insertion of a very dry sense of humor is a big part of this. He said, for example, in 1950, no one can be a social scientist in Canada without a sense of humor. A joke is a joke, but no one wants to die laughing. He even included thought puzzles in his writings. He did this in part to challenge what he called the weakness of omniscience. That is, when we write something down, we, we read it, we agree with it, it becomes almost concretized in our minds. And there's very little reflection that takes place, unless you're a trained uh, uh, cr cr critic of what you're reading. He was critiquing, in fact, the certainty that comes from mostly quantitative forms of analysis. He was critiquing most directly neoclassical economists at the time, who related everything to money or money values. And this was related to his well-known critique of what he called the price system. That the price system dominates, an institution that dominates our thinking and our decision making without reflective thought. Uh, one puzzle that comes up that I think is, a, is illustrative comes from Lewis's, Lewis Carroll's The Walrus and the Carpenter. And in one of the chapters he wrote for Political Economy in the Modern State, the book that's coming out shortly, um, he makes this for the first time, as far as I know, in any of his work, uh, 
uh, a central lengthy uh, part of his presentation, but he doesn't give any clear reason why. It's the only time that I know how he, he gives uh, um, um, a great amount of, 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 uh, of weight to a work of literature. One of the reasons why um, McLuhan called him a hick. So McLuhan, of course, is English literature. Innes was plainly not. But let me read this Wallerson the Carpenter excerpt that he uses because it's important. The walls and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose, the waller said, that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. So I think he's most obviously, it's one level of analysis here, he's obviously critiquing what he would consider to be the nonsense of those who want to organize the complexity of life by reducing it to numbers. And who, what more absurd sight than a walrus and a carpenter walking hand in hand and complaining about the grains of sand on a beach. <laughs> it reminds him of the mainstream economist or the statistics dependent policymaker who wants everything orderly and controlled. This is the mechanization of knowledge that he's critiquing. Besides its critique of, of the mechanization of knowledge and the absurd values it implies, here the reader is left with little idea as to why this quotation, amusing quotation, is so prominent. But in thinking about Nines on Canada the last couple of months, I've come up with at least one interpretation, which may be wrong, but here we go. Carol, the pen name of Oxford mathematician Charles Dodson, used nonsense as a tool to critique the notion that the quantification of life could replace the more challenging search for truth. Mathematics, for example, originally in Greece, was a tool for the philosopher's efforts at logical reasoning. But by Carol Dodgson's time, the mid-19th century, mathematics had become itself a truth-yielding specialization. Indeed, in Innes' in mind, it had become a form of dead knowledge. The Walsh and the Carpenter Hunting of the Snark, Alice in Wonderland, and other works by Carol Dodson, known by some as his nonsense writings, should not be just related to Innes' concerns about the specialization and mechanization of knowledge, however. Nonsense itself can be defined as a collection of words not fitting into commonly shared institutionalized systems of meaning. The nonsense of unreflective forms of nationalism comes to mind here. Like nationalism, the nonsense that Carol Dodgson presents makes sense, even though it is nonsense. I can explain that later if you want, or try to. But to make sense of the nonsense, we need to develop the capacity to do the intellectual work that's required to make sense of the nonsense. And perhaps this is one of the reasons why Innes dramatically shifted his research towards, in the 1940s, his examination of over 4,000 years of history, focusing on communications and the question, why do we attend to the things to which we attend? In removing himself from the institutionalized thinking norms of his place and time, Innes sought to gain some historical and comparative perspective, and thus understanding of our own everyday biases. In other words, he believed that humanity needs to develop a method that, could, that can help it make sense of the nonsense. And it was through his communication studies that he sought to develop a means of gaining insight as to why and how profoundly destabilizing irrationality, such as extreme forms of nationalism, had become something of an unquestionable common sense. Let me offer up another piece of evidence that raises questions as to the nature of Innes' Canadian nationalism. Beginning in 1945, at the end of 1945, Innes is one of only, was one of 11 person, people, and the only Canadian invited to take part in a group called the Committee to Frame a World Constitution. In 1948, it published what was called the Preliminary Draft of a World Constitution, a proposal that was dedicated to Gandhi. It argued for a federalist world order in which freedom, justice, and peace would be pursued as the world's dominant values. This, for Innes, was in opposition to the values of, say, exchange values, of the price system, 
of money-based means of calculating whether something was worthwhile or not. Predictably, in the United States, the plan was panned by many as a veiled call for international communism. While in the Soviet Union, it was dismissed as a liberal plot to undermine the revolution. But in relation to the subject at hand, I think Innes' participation suggests that he was not interested in developing Canada or any nation state as an end in and of itself. His much larger concern was what he constantly referenced as the fate of civilization. As he wrote in 1950, in the middle of the 20th century, surely the lowest ebb in any civilization has been reached when it is possible to threaten the lives of thousands of people with atomic bombs. Nation states for Innes were institutionalized orders entailing certain political, economic, and power relations, and of course, social capacities. If nation states such as Canada are doing harm to peace and justice of their citizens and others, it's reasonable that they should be subordinated in light of a larger universal good. And some of Innes's writings, which seem to be anti-democratic, are really anti-democracies which do harm to people. That is manipulated by propaganda, by commercialism, etc., which undermine humanity's capacity to work together. Now, having said this, Innes did, in fact, contemplate an important role for Canada to play in the world as a sovereign nation state. And this, frankly speaking, is where Innes's ambitions for Canadian culture, especially through the Academy, borders sadly on, I'll have to admit, the absurd. Canada, given its position for decades, situated between the past British and the new American empires, was in his mind a place that might have, been a, might have a substantive impact on the fate of civilization, especially the cultural and intellectual capacities that he related to the Greeks. Canada's relative underdevelopment, underdevelopment, he thought, meant that its cultural institutions were not as ossified as those in the imperial metropoles. The Greeks, as Innes knew, had a similar background in having the freedom relative to other empires to develop its own cultural capacities. Excuse me. Now let's go back to the quote I referenced at the outset, written by Innes just one in the last year of his life. But this time, with the effects of these developments on Canadian culture have been disastrous. The dangers to national existence warrant an energetic program to offset them. We are indeed fighting for our lives. When he says our, I don't think he's talking about Canadians. I think he's talking about humanity. <laughs> By attempting constructive efforts to explore the cultural possibilities of various media of communication and to develop them along lines free from commercialism, Canadians might make a contribution to the cultural life of the United States by releasing it from its dependence on the sale of tobacco and other commodities. That is, American culture is primarily driven by commercialism, capitalism, the need to make a buck. It has a cultural dependency on the sale of tobacco and other commodities. Canada can free it of that, at least give it a different voice, an alternate voice. We might now ask precisely, what developments in Canadian culture have been so disastrous? And how is an answer to this question related to Innes' hope that Canadians might make a contribution to the cultural life of the United States? What does that mean? Innes, as I hope you've picked up so far, after the First World War, was never a nationalist in the parochial sense. He believed that there was a declining vitality in Western thought, and that the capacity for reflective, creative, living knowledge was in a state of crisis. The war, the Depression, the Holocaust, the Second World War, the atomic bomb, the Cold War, and indeed the ascent of jingoistic nationalism all reflected and deepened this technology-mediated disaster as he saw it. Innes argued that to redress these developments, the first step would be to forge the conditions needed to make the crisis apparent at least among those with the time and resources to recognize it, especially or namely scholars in the university. Now, as I said earlier, the larger dialectic informing much of Innes' work was that between power and knowledge, a transhistorical dialectic, if you like. For over 4,000 years, these have been interdependent, but those in power usually neglect the creative and critical dimensions of knowledge, neglecting, for example, the arts and humanities, philosophy. 
As a result, those in power are biased towards relatively uncreative means of sustaining their positions, often looting, looting the cultural resources of others, ultimately involving the use of force. Violence, however, as history demonstrated to Innes, eventually leads to collapse. What was different this time for Innes in the mid-20th century was the use of unprecedented knowledge mechanizing technologies and techniques by those in power, specifically to stifle self-reflective thought. So for Innes, the bipolar thinking that characterized the Cold War was fundamentally wrong as it represented him the triumph of institutions of power and force over knowledge. I can explain later if my nose doesn't start running. Um, uh, why specifically 20th century capitalism produced uh, these extraordinary conditions, whereas other examples in which power dominated knowledge did not. There was something different going on in the 20th century. As you wrote in 1950, the effects of new media of communication evident in the outbreak of the Second World War were intensified during the progress of that war. They were used by the armed forces in the immediate prosecution of the war and in propaganda both at home and against the enemy. In Germany, the realism of the war was exploited by taking moving pictures of battles and showing them in theaters almost immediately afterwards. The German people were given an impression of realism such as compelled them to believe in the superiority of, Ger of German arms and realism became not only most convincing but also with the collapse of the German front most disastrous. In some sense, the problem of the German people is the problem of Western civilization. As modern developments in communication have made for greater realism, they have made for greater possibilities of delusion. The perfection of communications technologies, what he's saying here, demonstrable in their use to mimic and thus flatten reality, also makes them deadly as tools of commercialism and propaganda. But more than this, these technologies are deadly for the survival of reflective forms of knowledge. The speed up of things, for example. The delusion of our perceived reality, he believed, was undermining the importance of interpretation, the importance of interpretation, of philosophy, of art, the importance of time-consuming reflection, intellectual rigor, and thoughtfulness. And this is what he meant by his well-known paradoxical statement that advancements in communications have made understanding more difficult. Immediate, I understand, I see, I experience. Hence, why do I need interpretation? Why do I need to think and participate as the active audience as much as I needed to in the past? Thus, for Innes, the threat of American cultural homogenization was not his pro concern primarily because it was a threat to Canadian identity and, indep and independence. This is not Innes. Canadian so sovereignty meant nothing if Canadians were just as thoughtless and reactionary as he thought that the powerful in America were. Innes instead was resisting the mechanization and deep deadening of knowledge that technologies and commercialism had made so attractive. So what of his statement that Canadians might make a contribution to the cultural life of the United States? As he put it elsewhere, Canada might play the role of the small bird which picks the teeth of the crocodile and in compensation gives warning of danger. So Innes saw Canada as a place whose national borders gave it the time and space needed to comprehend and potentially counterbalance the cultural apocalypse centered in the South. And Canada was uniquely positioned to do this because as an insider-outsider in relation to the American hegemon, arguably Canadians could know Americans better than they know themselves. Um, he liked to refer to the example of reports he would see almost every year of a couple in a cabin in northern Canada snowed in for a couple of months and inevitably somebody gets murdered. Now, the reason for that is you may not know yourself very well, but if you're locked up with somebody for a long period of time, you know everything about them. They go like this, Why, why'd you do that? I know what you meant. <laughs> and he would see this as a, you know, a fun example of how it is that cultures can influence and understand each other if they are both together and apart at the same time, insiders, outsiders. In a way, Innes' life's work went from an interest in the exploitation of natural resources and the margins of empire to, especially in the later part of his life, the tragic neglect of cultural resources at the center of empire. 
Kennedy thought and hoped might be uniquely positioned to redress this tragedy. He cited T.S. Eliot's reference to a true satellite culture as one which, for geographical and other reasons, has a permanent relation to a stronger one. As Eliot put it, the satellite or marginal culture exercises a considerable influence upon the stronger culture and so plays a larger role in the world at large than it could in isolation. As such, the survival of the satellite culture is of very great value to the stronger culture. While nationalism and the nation state were institutional impediments to a just and peaceful world, strategically in the case of Canada, there was still hope. Hope that the small bird could be a creative and critical resource for the crocodile, thus potentially ameliorating its reactionary tendencies, especially its potential use of violence now, potentially a nuclear holocaust. But having said this, and I'll finish with this point, Innes, as a student of Greek thought, must have been aware of the myth or story of Pandora's box, or to be more accurate, Pandora's jar. The main myth in Innes' work is, um, is, is, uh, is the myth of, myth of Prometheus, which I can talk about it, uh, later if, if we have time. But part of the myth of Prometheus is the story of Pandora. So he was, certainly would have known this. Um, that this is the most, the latest photo I could find of Innes that's publicly available, and his daughter Anne is standing in front of him, perhaps symbolizing in what I'm going to talk about, hope. And that, of course, is Pandora. By opening the jar, all of the things that plague humanity, according to the Greeks, were released into the world, namely old age, labor, sickness, insanity, vice, and passion. But there was one more spite on humanity on this list. Delusional hope. Hope was a spite on humanity. While hope prevents us from giving up in the face of endless ordeals, for the Greeks, hoping for a life that can never be only prolongs our torment and misdirects us away from recognizing the conditions that underlie our situation. Innes, in the end, likely realized that his Canadian nationalism as a means of nurturing the conditions needed for living forms of knowledge at the margins of the American empire was indeed a false hope. His nationalist aspirations perhaps might be related to what Plato called a noble lie. A conscious lie forged for, let's put it this way, a pharmacological purpose. Not for self-empowerment, but instead one crafted to prevent social illness and possible death, at least in this ideal form. During much of his life, Innes' nationalism was full of contradictions, both hopeful and pessimistic, progressive and conservative. But in his final years, he told his wife that he thought his life's work had been a failure. And whatever hope he'd had for Canada and the Canadian, economy, Canadian Academy was almost gone. If Innes were alive today, he'd be 123 years old. He would probably see in the Canadian state the primary means of supporting a distinctively Canadian culture. But he would also understand it to be an organization or institution that has, in fact, facilitated the culture's ongoing commercialization. Seeing today's academy in Canada and its Lewis Carroll-like nonsensical emphasis on the practical, on the applicable, and on the measurable, I think Innes, Innes might well have cursed the day that delusional hope was released from Pandora's jar. He would, I think, find today's Canadian nationalism to be, for the most part, repulsive especially in terms of its commercial and political exploitation by the powerful, not to mention its sentimental references to war. In this vein, he might well have regarded my presentation tonight under the banner Canada 150 to have been at the very least a waste of time. But I hope, perhaps a delusional hope, that in conveying Innes' extreme pessimism, it's not come across as just another piece of nationalist propaganda. I'll end there. Thank you. Questions, comments, anger? <laughs> Please. Um, uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Um, 
I was wondering, like, um, because uh, in sociology, Ennis is also read. Uh, Say that again, sorry. In sociology, yes. Ennis is also read. Yes. And uh, the time when he was writing, 1940s and 50s, if I got it right, and I was wondering if, there, uh, if he had any uh, conversations or correspondence with uh, people like uh, C.B. McPherson at U of T or C. Wright Mills <clears throat> down in the South. They came after him. He died in 1952. Uh, C.B. McPherson, I think, replaced his position in the Department of Political Economy two years after Innes died. So I don't think he knew them, no. Uh, he did have brief conversations with Marshall McLuhan, but he dismissed McLuhan as a bit of a nutter. So <laughs> he did, they, did, they weren't pursued. <clears throat> thought, him, thought him to be unmaterialist and I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So he, he politely simply didn't respond to his mail after a while. Mm. Whereas McLuhan, about 15, 20 years later, when he published, um, well, I can't remember, the, the, the 1962 book, um, anyway, wrote an introduction th saying that this is just a footnote to Innes. Mm. And this is before McLuhan was well established. And so there was think, there's, there's been some critique that McLuhan was actually using his relationship with Innes, even though there really wasn't one, mm. to put him on that level mm. as an important, preeminent Canadian mm. academic. Understanding media, that's the book. Mm -hmm. But like people who came later, like especially C.B. McPherson and all, did uh, they take him up uh, in the sense of uh, well, I think I think the the, sta the Staples theory of Canadian, you know, dependency and vulnerability in relation to core countries and metropoles. I think there was part of McPherson's work, but McPherson was fundamentally a Marxist uh, scholar, and um, there wasn't a recognition that Innes had much to do with Marxist, the Marxist paradigm, probably until the 1970s when Mel Watkins and other people, my old mentor Ian Parker raise that connection. So during the period of, of McPherson, I don't think there was a direct connection, except for an understanding of political economy as a, as a complex, holistic subject, mm -hmm. which was then being essentially narrowed down to political economy is now what we call Marxism, and, other, and the rest of it is just economics, and became, became more and more narrow in its focus. Thank you very much.